Now, when I tell you my first time watch of this movie had me bawling, like not bawling, bawling. I was crying so freaking much. <sighs> Just let Lucy stay with Sam. guys welcome back to my channel it's tyra here with another struggle review here to discuss i am sam now this movie stars sean penn and dakota fanning now before i get into all things i don't want to read the book if you can't i need you guys to drop down and subscribe to my channel and like this video i'm going to give you guys a moment to do that then we're going to come back and discuss although this movie had me emotional i was invested i was crying the movie is also dated and really problematic with its representation. Go back, 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 back. guys have hopefully subscribed to see more of me let's get into this movie but before we jump into the video i have to give a shout out to the person who paid for and requested this film so if you happen to listen to a couple of beatles songs and then read dr seuss's green eggs and ham it's not because of me it's because of this person right here thank you so much for supporting me and paying for this content now this movie was written and directed by Jesse Nelson. She also directed Stepmom as well as Karina Karina. Now in saying that this movie is problematic within its representation, it's not to take away from the sentimental value that I feel that this movie has. However, we do seem to get a lot of the same traits when our main character is neo-divergent. If we're not being withdrawn and emotionalist, our character is often a genius, a savant, absolutely phenomenal when it comes to problem solving. They don't often get to be the centers of their own narrative. We are here solely as inspiration or a teacher to a different character. That character probably doesn't take heed of the simple nuances, joys, and subtleties of life. I, as that neurodivergent character, I'm here to enlighten, open up, which allows you at the end of every single one of these movies to say, I am a better person because of you. We also often take the focus off of our neurodivergent character and solely decide to focus on how this is affecting somebody else. You having OCD, Tourette's, ADHD, autism, Asperger's, Down syndrome, as my cousin, my brother, my sister, my dad, my mother, this is affecting my everyday life in this way. Oh, the hardship. And lastly, because if I name all of them child, we would be here all day. We often have neurodivergent characters being portrayed by neurotypical people, not only within the role, but even just getting into coordinators, writing teams, set design, no one attached to the film who is actually live with what's being portrayed, which makes the portrayal come off offensive. We have actors contorting their faces, their bodies, expressions, their speech to convey their idea, which is often narrow-minded of what a neurodivergent character does. It's very formulaic to the fact that it is now considered Oscar bait when actors decide to take on and portray these roles. Everything is on a spectrum. All of these portrayals should be different, but we continue to get the same thing every single time. <sighs> With all of that being said, this movie has a lot of that and other things, but it also does a lot of things right. Let's get into it. Now we first meet Sean Penn here as Sam doing an impeccable job. Per usual, he is a great character actor, has been since the 70s. He never portrays one character the same. He completely dives in and transforms himself 
from, you know, Dead Man Walking, Mystic River, and my favorite, Milk. And though Sam is never actually diagnosed within the film, nobody says it outright. And if you look on Wikipedia, it merely states that he has mental disabilities. But I also thought that we were watching someone with autism. The opening scene with him working in Starbucks, sorting things according to color, space, size, all of the accuracy, the way that he is interacting with coworkers, other customers, you can clearly see that he is neurodivergent and he mentally functions differently than everybody else around him. When we have Sam gone to the hospital and the baby is immediately born and he is left because homegirl jolts, leaving him with the sole responsibility of this baby. How we walked out of this hospital without a car seat, I don't know. <laughs> but she literally runs off. We do, of course, find out that this is, you know, maybe a homeless woman. She never actually cared about him. She solely used him for his job and, you know, him having a stable place to live. I don't want to hold her, let alone name her. Sam has been completely taken advantage of and is left to name Lucy after one of his favorite Beatles songs the Beatles played repeatedly throughout the entire movie. Through the brief interactions that you get with Sam, the way that you see him interact with the baby, I was absolutely terrified and scared for Lucy, who's a newborn. We also get into the style of directing in the these camera angles, the really quick close-ups, these jarring angles, these, you know, spiraling circular motion with the camera, it really gives you anxiety. And I felt like they were trying to match the emotions that might be coming through Sam. He was anxious and I was anxious too. Now, the more I got into Sam, the more I enjoyed this movie. After the first five minutes and I got over my first interpretation of Sam, you really get into why you enjoy this movie. A lot of things here with Sam represent any neurotypical person. Even though Sam is Sam, the way that he is interacting with Lucy, the way that he is nervous, the way that he is taking care of her, feeding her the diaper, the anxiousness, is how a lot of first time parents are. But when we have scenarios like our neighbor Annie having to explain that Lucy as a newborn needs to be fed every two hours in certain terms that only he can understand, you can't help but give, you know, pushback and be nervous. He is very careful and gentle and loving with Lucy. So even though you are thinking about all of the scenarios that could go wrong, you are also looking at everything he's doing right. Now, of course, we never meet any of Sam's family. And later on in the film, we do find out that he is pretty much a product of the system and was born and raised there. We do not have Sam raising Lucy by himself. When I tell you the click was clicking, I loved all of Sam's friends and how they were taking care of Lucy. And just, man, it, I, I love them. I love them all the way down. Though we're dealing with things like Down syndrome, autism, agoraphobia, you never just solely see that. His friends are stern, devoted, loving, endearing, fun, funny, individualistic, really supportive. Whether they are complaining about Sam skipping movie night, the changes within the friendship dynamic ever since Sam became a father, them setting up that freaking answering machine. So many moments of comedy here that I absolutely did not expect. The heartwarming scene of them banding together to purchase Lucy some shoes like, uh, you solely see them as family, not Sam's neurodivergent friends watching them as well as Annie you walk away wishing that you could have friends that are half as good and invested as Sam's and the same can be said about Sam as a father of course Lucy doesn't stay an infant she eventually grows and she becomes a seven-year-old Dakota Fanning Dakota Fanning slaps like here's some claps up for Dakota <laughs> Dakota is freaking amazing. I need her praises as just, you know, an actress now, praise more often. With this being her first real major role within the film, you would never guess that. From movies like Hide and Seek, Uptown Girls, Man on Fire, Secret Life of Bees, 
she has always carried this essence and this little brilliance about her in the way that she acts in these roles as if she has been here before. You've grown with Sam, you've grown with Lucy, but eventually you start to notice and she starts to notice that she is asking questions that Sam is ill-equipped to answer. But you find joy in the same way that she finds joy for her father. Even though he is different from everybody else's dad, he is also more attentive and involved with me than everybody else's dad. She is the center of his world, you know, from bedtime to playtime to story time, school, walks, parks. She is absolutely his everything. As soon as that is threatened to be taken away, you die a little inside. The fact that the title of this film, I Am Sam, is a reference to the Green Eggs and Ham Dr. Seuss book that just happens to be Sam's favorite because it is one of the few that he has the capacity to read. <sighs> Why ain't you told me I was gonna be crying? Watching this movie, you kind of have to throw away sensible thinking and get into a little fantasy and disbelief. Even though you know it is completely unattainable for Lucy to really stay and grow up with Sam because he does have the mental capacity of a seven-year-old himself. So the question comes into play, what exactly is going to happen when there are you know, more scenarios that he is not equipped to handle? You repeatedly have all of these crappy scenarios begin to happen, like Lucy starting to be embarrassed by her father. You know, what was once funny and we're having fun when we have other children acknowledge this as wrong, you know, hey, something's wrong with your dad. That's not normal. And it is starting to affect what Lucy once thought was okay. Even when we get into not only all of these eyes also being on them and being almost taken advantage of, rolled up on by this prostitute and just arrested out of nowhere. My life, I ain't even make no transaction. I ain't even rub her. <laughs> he is, you know, arrested and more eyes are put on him as, you know, unstable, some type of unfit father. And even getting into to uh, Lucy's behavior with him being all she knows, she does not want to mentally surpass him. So she is trying to read a little less, do a little less, mispronounce words. What saves this is Sam. <laughs> Sam saves this all day long. I know you can't pronounce those words. I want you to read. I want you to be your best self. Even though I may be whatever, I know what's best for you. And I want the best for my daughter, regardless of my mental state. Like, <sighs> Sam displays so much freaking nuance and thoughtfulness that you just do not get from your everyday parent. Now, of course, he isn't perfect. He is really loud. He is animated. He has these mood swings. And we see this displayed a whole lot when we have Lucy want to try something different and go to a different restaurant. And Sam just completely does not understand why we don't have this on the menu and why can't I have this this way? Getting into, you know, autism and different things like that and spectrums, a lot of things come down to repetition and things staying the same but with Lucy getting older things cannot remain as they once were resulting in you know these outbursts in these tantrums she knows exactly who her dad is but all of these people surrounding all of these eyes watching leaving a really young and impressionable Lucy to be embarrassed and ashamed for the first time Loretta Devine came through and rubbed salt on the wound. Oh, you know this had to be a special movie. I ain't never been mad at Loretta. Here's where we get into multiple scenarios within the movie where the writing is not the best. We have the most contrived <laughs> scenario ever for Lucy to be taken from Sam when they were already under such a watchful eye. We have this badass kid. I don't know why he was there. Why was you and your father even in the vicinity if y'all thought so low of Sam in the first place? The party was about to go down. We got the cake, we got the decorations, the gift, the moon bounce. Sam was showing out every single year for his daughter. 
Now I could have sworn that it was Sam who got pushed down in his own house, but he is the one looked at as the agitator. You are not only endangering all of these kids here, but you are a danger to Lucy. CPS caseworker Loretta decides it is best to remove Lucy from the home. Like, <sighs> I hated the way that Sam was instantly villainized. I hated the way that she didn't even take a quarter of an ounce of time to either, you know, get to know them, understand their dynamic, understand Lucy. Like, I hate, it was just so heartbreaking, especially when we have him really understand the ramifications of Lucy being gone and no longer in his care. Now needing a lawyer to obtain custody of Lucy back, we get into Miss Michelle Pfeiffer. I love the mentions here of Kramer versus Kramer, the film, and you know, that being a part of the Clicks movie night because this movie mirrors that movie a whole lot in many different ways. Michelle Pfeiffer's character is really work consumed, really nonchalant about the bottom line. I can't help you. I don't want to help you. You can can't afford me. But as she tries to get rid of Sam multiple times, you can't help but notice a lot of similarities between the two and a lot of traits within her. She has her own personal outbursts when she doesn't get her way, like Sam. She also has her own tics of, you know, kind of engorging on these different snacks, mostly candies, when she is nervous. Hmm. And most noticeably, she is not really a good mother at this point. She she is very forgetful, not at all attentive. It doesn't really care to be anything to her son at this moment outside of the material things that she can afford him. Sam, however, is like, girl, your son is online too. You might want to get that really displaying to us that the line is really blurred when it comes to who and what is considered to be a good parent. I also really love Sam's processing, understanding, and behavior when it came to getting Lucy back. When I tell you my boy was fighting, he was trying so hard with all of his might and his capacity. Okay, you're saying I don't have enough money to afford you. Let me get some more hours at my job. Let me try, you know, boost up, maybe get promoted to a different position. Let me come out here to you repeatedly in your face, plead my case. I don't know much, but I do know that I need you and I need your help to get her back. He was absolutely relentless. A lot of behaviors, once again, that we don't see from neurotypical parents. A lot of moments here that go, don't underestimate me just because of who I am. Don't look over me, child. If you told me that such and such was going to help me on the back end and you were going to refer me, I'm going to show up and be in your face and hold you to your promise. Like, even though she ends up taking the case uh, for appearances, I'm not completely money hungry and driven by greed. I will take a case and help someone pro bono. I love the fact that he stayed on her. I love the fact when we are reduced to two hours of visitation with Lucy, Lucy, you know, realizes, I know what this is, acknowledging that she misses her father, but she also processes the fact that I need to do and say these things because I want to go back with him. Yeah, whatever, girl. I know damn well that's a two-way mirror and y'all sitting back there taking your little notes. And I know that you're a therapist and you're trying to get me to slip up and say something about my dad. I'm not going for it. Absolutely funny joyful, endearing, and dope. Also sad because getting into things like the therapy sessions or the two-way mirror, you see how far apart mentally, even at the age of seven or eight, Lucy is from him, but you believe in them so much. And then when we get into the freaking trial where he is almost a non-factor, solely because they don't feel like he has the capacity to offer anything of value to the case in the fight. And this doesn't, you know, just stand for the opposing team. This stands for his lawyer as well. Though she's taken this case out of the kindness of her heart, she is still a devoted shark and just simply wants to win just because she's her. You're not going to offer me anything, you know, your neurodivergent friends here as character, you know, witnesses. They have their own little quirks and traits to where I can't rely on them. I can't rely on any of you. Annie won't even come out of her own house. What can you do for me? I absolutely love when we have Sam recognize this and say, if you think the same thing of me that the other lawyers do, 
I do not stand a chance in getting my daughter back. But once again, when the movie gets your hopes up and you're rooting for them, they also sprinkle in a little bit just to take you down a notch. Like the fact that Lucy is able to trick him into trying to run away. Her realizing what this all really means, what foster care is. You know what, hey, this little, you know, two hour interaction, let's just get on a bus and go. The fact that she was able to coerce and trick him says a whole lot about their dynamic and why this would not be a safe situation situation for Lucy long term but you believe in their love you believe in their love it's precious with the case now in a heightened state and being so disruptive, it is absolutely a game changer that we get Annie to step out on faith and step out of her home after so many years just to plead her case for Sam and Lucy. Like, man, the friends were riders. <sighs> Shout out to the click. <laughs> Shout out to the click. I hated the way the lawyers handled Annie on that stand. Annie was doing uh, so well. You know, she is very educated comes from a very influential background. However, dealing with our agoraphobia and then bringing up the trauma that she has with her father from the past, probably an extension of why she doesn't want to come out the house, this completely throws her off course and shakes her like, oh, oh, it's making me mad. <laughs> but I did love the fact that we tied that into why she cared for Sam and Lucy so much. Not only because I've been there to witness this, but I never received that from my own father child the defense team was doing every single thing to rip lucy out that home take down every single witness you would have swore that he was just this horrible freaking parent that sam is naturally the most honest caring transparent person in any room he stands in child when he is yelling at that screen in the courtroom because lucy has decided to lie about them trying to run away and you know you don't have like it was really, really getting to me. Like I was just all kind of emotional. And then we have the portrayal and that dynamic and that love between him and Lucy in parallels with, you know, Michelle Pfeiffer and that relationship, that non-existent neglectful relationship that she has with her son, her being impatient, her doing her own little quirks and things like, hey, I don't want my llama beans to touch my corn. It's just so many parallels between the two. I love every single moment that we kind of had Sam put Michelle's character in her place, you know, when he is trying to pay for the food. Like, don't underestimate me. I can do it. It may take me a little bit longer to process and count the money for this food, but don't underestimate what I'm capable of. Girl, you're gonna wait until I count out these dollars in this change, like over there. <laughs> I love that. But once we get into that court prep and them growing closer, he has no real room for lying or deceit, so it's really hard to coach him on what to say. But her becoming more caring, getting him a new suit, him getting a little bit more responsibility at work, you know, that promotion, it proves to be a little too much for Sam. Before we get to this courtroom scene, did anybody think that Michelle wanted to rub knees with Sam real briefly? I'm just saying. <laughs> there were a lot of moments that gave you know intimate like a little bit more than care as a lawyer it was like you know what hey I see some sentiments within Sam that I just like as a man you know maybe some things that are just really you know compassion that I'm not seeing from the likes of my husband I just felt like Briefly, she wanted to rub Sam's elbows. But getting back into the court case. With the whole courtroom scene absolutely breaking my heart, Sam not only messing up his suit, being a little late to the court, but just feeling under freaking pressure with all of these questions coming at him. Of course, we have defense going out of their way to trip and kind of choke him up on how he can relate to things. All that practice, all that process, and all that coaching on what to say goes out of the window and we revert back to what we know best because we are under so much scrutiny. When I think about love and the passion that I have for my daughter, I can only relay that emotion to things like a Beatles song or my favorite movie, you know, Kramer versus Kramer. This is why I should be her dad. 
emotional tricked up and breaking down, the lawyers, the court, the judge decides to completely remove Lucy from his care and send her into foster care. Like them, like physically separating them, that hug and you know, trying to kind of like low key pull them apart. Really, really sad stuff. And even sadder when we get into Sam feeling completely inferior in comparison to Lucy's new home, new mom, and new foster family to the point that he completely gives up on getting Lucy back and mentally and physically builds a wall around himself. What are you doing with all of this self-pity? You have helped me, you know, need to help somebody grow closer with my own son and my own family dynamic. I want you to fight and not give up for Lucy. Just figuring out that you may think that I am, you know, normal and strong and have it all together. I am just as damaged as the next person. No one is perfect, not even me. I mess up and feel like a failure and feel like I'm not enough all the time, just like you. Sam repeatedly going, you know, you don't know what it's like when you try and you try and you never get there. Like, <laughs> too much. Of course she, you know, gets consoled by Sam. You know what I'm saying? What she was waiting on. I'm just saying, Sam show helped her a lot. Told her, you know, I'll be your friend. I'll be your person. You need to leave your husband though. No, you know, malice with it. But Sam, I saw you, Sam. Game, peep, game. Anywho, <laughs> in our process to still fight for Lucy, it's not, you know, as easy as it seems because Lucy has, you know, built up a little wall of her own, thinking that her father forgot about her. I love how the courtroom and nobody ever acknowledged that Sam himself Self was a product of the system and mistreated and you know just threw her on over to this Karen all right well you know what she was she was cool or whatever she came off as a Karen the way that she was so quickly to judge him and not know anything about him as far as this foster mother was concerned Lucy was already her daughter you are a disruption on what I currently want my new family to be now of course we learn later on that she is so passionate and so eager to cultivate this because she has had a problem conceiving but she never gave him a real fair chance and even though uh he is watching lucy he is getting a little closer moving closer leaving little breadcrumbs behind that say hey i am still here he never really invaded their space in turn we flip it we reverse it and it's lucy that is invading his space. Once again, with suspending a whole bunch of disbelief here in this film, Lucy, little Lucy, has been getting out of her own bed at night, walking all the way down the street, you know, past Texaco's, Shell Stations, Exxon's, and all those other good things. <laughs> and making her way to her dad's house to you know talk with him be with him like i was like what the hell is this baby's day out you you really expect me to believe that lucy is doing all of this and going completely unnoticed and every single time he would return and even though the mother is at first annoyed and disturbed by this she eventually accepts the fact that this is all lucy's shot they had to put bars they had to lock lucy up <laughs> to keep her from sneaking out this is all lucy Lucy's doing. You know what? I can't really force that relationship with her. That's something that has to be cultivated and grown. And matter of fact, there is a reason that Lucy is this, you know, this bright, this, you know, loving, this brilliant, all of these traits that I love so much for me to want to be her mother. She got those from somewhere. It was probably her dad. If I truly and honestly want something with her, I should probably embrace that and embrace him. I really love the ending scene, you know, with him kind of trying to understand what's going on. And he goes, you know, hey, are you going to tell the courts on me? Like, absolutely wonderful when we got into his process of thinking, really acknowledging the fact, even though he is stating things like, you know what, I always wanted Lucy to have a mother. When he states, you know, hey, I think that you are the red in her painting. He also has an understanding of I love her, but I can only do so much and go so far. I am going to need help. I would love if we can, you know, low key co-parent, like, whoo, you know, wipe a little sweat off your forehead. <laughs> we knew for the, you know, the most part, this 
was just not a safe situation for Lucy long term. So to know that he's not only gonna have help from her and she has a new understanding of who he is and the type of father that he is, but you know, we already have our clique, already have our friends, and now we have Rita. A really great ending to an absolutely loving film. All of us can ever hope to have a dad like Sam. Well, you guys, that was my review for I Am Sam. I hope you enjoyed it. Please drop down and tell me if you did. Like, this movie had me on a whole emotional roller coaster in the best way. I would love to hear your thoughts on this movie, on my review, and also leave a like because it helps me out. I see you guys next time for my next movie review. Bye.